when it was organized in uh, 1970, it was called the People's Free Clinic. And that was uh, taken, uh, the work was taken over by young doctors and nurses that felt that uh, there was a need for taking care of the street people and so forth that were here in the area. So the Congregational Church agreed to allow the uh, clinic to use the basement under the sanctuary as a place for meeting the patients and taking care of them. But we had some exciting times, like when the doctor who was working in his bare feet, uh, he was advised that the dress code wasn't real strict, but they didn't think that that was the proper way to be uh, waiting on patients that were coming to the clinic. So uh, he was admonished and uh, properly took care of it by even wearing a tie, I think, after that. When we had big rains while the basement in the, uh, the congregation of church got flooded, and everybody learned how to use the mop and clean the place up. But then later we had a sump pump installed in the basement, and that allowed the water to be taken off so that there was not so much uh, labor to use to mop the floors. But it was something that all the early members that worked at the clinic remembered very well because so did we in the church when we had been taking care of it. The 1974 was when the term free clinic was removed and it became People's Community Clinic after that. I had no idea when I got into this how many patients we were going to see. <laughs> we got started and we didn't realize what we were really getting into uh, because we thought we'd maybe see 10, 15 patients in a night. And I, I think the first night we were open, we saw 74 patients. At first, we didn't have any examining tables. Uh, I did my first pelvic in the bat in the, on a ledge in the bathroom, women's bathroom off the, uh, it was actually outside of the building. You know, you walked out and there was this bathroom, women's bathroom door, and I did my pelvic in there. And and uh, the, uh, I mean, this, this very attractive girl had uh, she had gonorrhea, and she had oh. venereal warts, and she had uh, herpes, <laughs> and uh, other than that, uh, she was healthy. <laughs> <laughs> we had lots of gonorrhea patients. Mm -hmm. We never had a patient with syphilis, uh, although we had one false positive for syphilis. Uh, but uh, as, as I said earlier in this evening, uh, when the guy walked in, uh, this fellow that we had that sort of ran the door there, uh, we called the chief, who was a Vietnam veteran, he jumped up on top of the table and said, let's all hear it for Joe Jones. He's our first case of syphilis. Everybody got up and clapped. <laughs> he, he, and he, he, actually didn't, he actually didn't have syphilis. But, uh, you know, things, things like that went on down there all the time. I remember one time uh, I saw this one guy walk by a table that had syringes on it, and he flipped the syringe across the room to a friend of his and caught it. Of course, I got it back from him, but I'm sure we lost syringes, you know. One doctor said, why are you doing this? I said, you got teenage daughters. You want them running around with all these people who have gonorrhea, you know, or you want me to treat it? It was so hot in the basement always. And somehow, uh, during my tenure, we got donated an air conditioning system. Wow. And I can remember when that, uh, that air conditioner came down and actually ran we thought it was the best day that had ever happened at the People's Community Clinic because in the mid-70s they actually had air conditioning and we had to decide, you know, did we still really have to go out and drink beer after the clinic was over because, you know, it was always so hot it was the big excuse of, well, we have to go drink beer now. My first job as director is I had to be the hard nose because it was just an open. We didn't have any appointments or anything like that. And people would line up. I mean, by sunset, there'd be a line all the way around the block, around that church. And I would have to be the one to go out and, and cut off the line. And there'd be people who'd, who'd been out there for hours and who were really sick, who were really hurting. Uh, one of the things we didn't do is venereal disease for men. So you had to learn how to screen out the symptoms. And that was a little you know, embarrassing sometimes, but, uh, but <laughs> well, Austin was a counterculture mecca. It was just absolutely incredible. Um, people were coming in, a lot of street people, but not street people as we know them today. There were young groups of roving uh, people, um, lots of women with babies, young women with babies, and uh, there was one particular group called the STP family, and they were just kind of scary-looking people. I would be 
kind of frightened to be around them today, but back then we thought they were normal. The problem was they all had these crabs, these little <laughs> crabs, and so nobody <laughs> wanted to sit where they were because we were afraid we'd catch crabs. So we had this couch called the crab couch, <laughs> and every time they would come in, we'd say, oh, go sit over there on the crab couch, and then no one would sit on it, and it was just like this, this couch that was just pariah for anybody who knew what it was. Austin needed such a clinic. Mm -hmm. It was just being here. I enjoyed coming to meetings, walking through the waiting room. I had responsibility in my day, 35 years in the Army, and ended up being the commander of the largest military hospital in the world, mm -hmm. Walter Which Reed. Walter Reed. And so I knew about clinics and had responsibility for and visited many all over the world. And I just always thought when I come into the, came into this waiting room that it was quieter, more organized, pleasanter, even with the kids running around, than most other clinics. Very impressed with that. It was just a very well-run operation. The church was so, you know, they were so nice. They, they let us, they, they let us invade their, their space, the basement of their church, uh, and, uh, and just take it over. And um, I mean, you know, there were just people hanging around, long lines out in front of the church every night, waiting for the doors to open. And the church never complained. They were just, oh, just sweet, so I, I really appreciated that. People's Clinic it used to be a free clinic, you know, during that time when there was, you know, like the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic, and all, you know, and People's Clinic was up there as one of those clinics, but they've all pretty much died away. Mm -hmm. and, and, and People's Clinic is, I, I don't know if it's the only one, but it's, if, if, if it, it isn't the only one, it's one of the few that has been able to make that transition to a community clinic that still serves, uh, you know, people that that uh, that are underserved otherwise. The doors would open and people would flood in, and then it was just chaos. It'd be like a mash. Everybody would do their thing, and it was great. And you'd see, I don't know how many people we'd see in the evening. It seemed like hundreds. I'm sure it wasn't, but you know, we'd see them, and and uh, and uh, then at the end of the evening, many of us would go to. Uh, you know, a local place, Lazy Me or something like that afterwards, and we'd all sit around and have a beer and just sort of, you know, unwind. And then, of course, the next day we'd uh, go and do it all again. And one of the things I really liked about the community clinic was that it, it, uh, it really attended to more than just the medical needs. It tried to really address the, you know, the, the, some of the social needs, some of the personal needs that, that people had and it cared. How I got down here was I was contacted by Sophie Weiss, who was the uh, um, executive director of, of the clinic at the time. And uh, I'd known Sophie from, uh, we'd both worked together at a uh, free clinic that I helped start in Albany, New York, called the Washington Park Free Medical Clinic. And uh, she thought that, that I might be interested because they had gotten some funding to actually pay a doctor for the first time, because up until that time it had all been free. Uh, volunteer doctors, and so they, uh, Sophie asked if I'd be interested in coming down and, and just checking it out. And I'd never been out of the Northeast, and so I said, sure. So uh, I came down, they showed me around, showed me the clinic, and took me around, uh, took me out to Lake Travis, skinny dipping, and uh, <laughs> how could you resist that? <laughs> you know, so, uh, so uh, I came down and, uh, and became the first uh, medical director, uh, paid medical director full-time for People's Clinic. The fellowship room was used for Lama's class. Uh, it also was used for a, a group, primarily women who had herpes and were not very happy about the men who had done that. And I almost felt guilty when I'd have to walk out through the midst and of course some of the language they were using was not exactly appropriate in a church. The clinic gave to me much more than what I gave to the clinic. Mm -hmm. 
and it gave to me a sense of uh, compassion and learning about helping other people. I mean, you know, when you're in college, you're very self-interested, mm -hmm. got to get your grades and whatever, but that was really the first volunteering work I have ever done. And with that compassion and a little bit of a turn on to medicine, I eventually mm -hmm. went to medical school. I remember the feeling of leaving each time and having known that I did a good thing. You walk down these old cement steps down to a, and there was a drain there and it always was kind of a dirty drain and in through the door and there were mattresses, kind of old mattresses on the floor where people sat and waited. Um, we had some ancient, ancient exam tables uh, in the back room and I think we just sort of had fold up screens between them. I can't really remember and then somebody actually built some little cubicles that we had curtains on. Of course there was there was an empty space at the top and the bottom of the cubicle so you could hear everything that was going on one cubicle to the other. Um, but it was very primitive. I spent a lot of time here and over time we went from being a volunteer to getting paid 250 an hour I think it was and we worked on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, I, and I was one of the first people that got sent to uh, the nurse practitioner training in Houston through Houston Planned Parenthood. I went there for, I can't remember, it was four or six months and then came back here and worked for another two years. I remember um, being astounded that people would have lab work done and they'd mm -hmm. write the lab work results on a piece of paper and they'd bring it up to the secretary and the secretary would take that information and, tra and, and uh, transcribe it onto the chart and then they'd throw that original piece of paper away and I go, no, you can't do that. You've got to keep the original lab work with the chart. So we got some, had to get some staplers and staple it into the chart. There were, uh, it was very primitive and it's changed to just the most incredible thing that I can imagine. My best memories are working with the people and uh, having a one-on-one -on -one relationship with my clients. Um, the, the most fun thing that we did here at the clinic was we invited partners of the women in and we taught them about the women's bodies as well as the women themselves. Um, I've actually gotten letters from people about making their first pelvic exam one of the best experiences of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, we used to hold a, a mirror up so that a woman could see her cervix and we'd have the partners in so that they could look and see what a cervix was too. We felt like birth control was sort of a family thing. and. Uh, when women had an IUD, they'd have a string that they had to feel to make sure that the diaphragm was, uh, the IUD was still in place. And so we wanted the guys to be able to participate in that also. And then I'd leave, the, I'd fit the diaphragm and then I'd leave the couple alone to kind of see if they could get in and out, in and out successfully. Um, my funniest memory is um, I walked out of the room and in a while I heard this hysterical laughing and giggling coming from the room and I knocked and went in. Actually I knocked on the wall because we just had curtains back then and kind of separated the curtain and walked in and there was the diaphragm just glued against the wall with the <laughs> diaphragm jelly. It had just suctioned across the room when the spring let go. And it was really neat. It was the first time that I ever worked in nursing where there truly was a communal dedication to having, um, having the patient be the primary person. Uh, some, sometimes I, I don't know how other people feel, but I go into the doctor's office now and I feel like I'm a name, I'm a number, uh, that the doctor is the most important person in the room. And I think that here at the clinic, what we felt like was that the person was the most important thing. And that the education of that person was of utmost importance. We tried to impart everything that we could possibly do in the short time that we were with them that would help them either not get sick again, make the best use of that, of whatever we helped them with at that time. Um, it just seemed like it was a truly personal service. Everybody that worked here was sort of on the same wavelength. And so there was just incredible camaraderie. Friends that I made at the clinic back then are friends that are still 
my best friends in my life now. Even though I live far away in Tennessee, I come to Austin three or four times a year just because my love of these people is so great and I'm um, so grateful to have had that mm -hmm. for all these years. I first became involved with the clinic as a patient and I was pregnant and I went to the prenatal clinic and while I was going through prenatal care there, the clinic discovered that I was a Lamaze teacher and they really needed a Lamaze teacher so they started pursuing me as a patient saying, it'd be great, you can be pregnant and you can teach the Lamaze class and it'll be perfect, you can deliver along with your students and I went, Okay, I'll do that. So I taught Lamaze classes and then I had my baby and then the clinic asked me to come and they had just lost their prenatal counseling coordinator and I was an RN and they asked me if I would be their prenatal counseling coordinator and I said yes and so I started that job. I was there during the days of the clinic that there were long lines of people going around the block waiting to come in to make an appointment for that night. The receptionist was this man with this ponytail that hung down his back. You know, he would walk out the door and go around the block so he could talk to everybody in line so they could be prepared, you know. And, um, you know, never forget, you know, he's walking through the line saying, All right, when you get to the front, give us your name. If you're giving us a fake name, be sure you give us the same fake name you gave us last time because we don't want to have two charts on you, okay? So just use, it's okay to use a fake name, just use the same one you did last time. You know? Those are my memories of the yeah. clinic. We had once a week staff meetings. All decisions were made by, by the entire staff, so everyone had equal input. You know, it was a very sort of old hippie kind of theory back then because we all also made the same amount of money. Didn't matter if you were doctor, nurse, receptionist, whatever. Everybody made exactly the same amount of money. <laughs> and so it was very much in that theory of collective, you know. To make an appointment at the clinic, you had to just show up at the door at four o'clock. All appointments were made at four o'clock on the day you wanted to be seen. But we didn't get rolling until about five, five thirty. And um, we would get out about midnight, sometimes 2 a.m., you know, so that's when clinic ran. And, and clinic ran that way because it was in the university area and they couldn't run the clinic in the daytime because there was no parking and there was no way to get in. So night clinics was the name of the game and that's what we did. What I was primarily interested in was for them to send me to nurse practitioner school. And back in those days, you kind of just waited in line to do that. You started as a nurse, you did counseling coordinating. After the nurse practitioner in the back was ready to leave, then they started talking to the nurse who'd been there for several years to send her to school. And I was a single parent. It was the only way I was going to be able to go to nurse practitioner school. So I was waiting. And sure enough, the nurse practitioner left, and they came to me and said, do you want to go to nurse practitioner school? And I said, you bet. I had two children by that time and I took both my kids and took off that nurse practitioner program was in Dallas and I went to Dallas. And the way that the clinic worked it, 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 in those years, that's how they got nurse practitioners. They sent them to school, they paid, you, they paid your salary while you were there in school and then when you got back you owed them two or three years mm -hmm. of working at a really low salary. So. I came back from nurse practitioner school and gave them two or three years. The entire staff seemed to all have the same philosophy and that was the patient comes first, we're here to take care of the patients, it's the highest priority and when everyone is feeling that way it happens and the patients get the very best, highest quality of care because it's the highest priority of every staff member.